Hey, I am Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Lincoln Hills Christian Church. And we are so glad that you're joining us today. I pray that God moves in this service and that he touches you in some way. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we can pray to you. We thank you that we have your presence. We thank you, Father, that we get to study you, that you have given us your word. Father, let us study that today. Let us sing to you with all of our heart. For we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time.
Lord's Supper is a very special time for me every Lord's Day. And it is on the Lord's Day, by the way. When you go to Acts, the 20th chapter, and verse 7, Luke writes this about the Lord's Supper. He says, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. Now, nobody likes a long sermon, but the idea here is that on the first day of the week, we come together to break bread. Now, that's why we do this is because it was the day Jesus was raised from the dead. When do we do it? We do it each Lord's Day, every Sunday, the first day of the week. I love the Lord's Supper because it's a time to reflect. It's a time to repent. It's a time to respond once we repent because repentance is about turning around and changing. So if we have sin in our life, then, then we, should, we should take care of it at that Lord's Supper. It gives us an opportunity to do that. That's just an awesome way to honor Jesus and what He's done for us. I'm going to pray, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper together. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the blessing that You gave to us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for the power of the resurrection. We gather around this table to remember Jesus by partaking of this bread and this cup. Lord, the bread represents uh, the broken body of Jesus, and we give thanks for that, for his shed blood that cleanses us from all sin. Bless us, Lord, as we come before you today to thank you for loving us so much that you gave us a way for hope in this life and hope in eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The bread that represents the broken body of Jesus. The cup that represents his shed blood. We come now to a time to where we give back to God a portion of what we have been given by God. You know, when I go on the internet or I get mail, emails, I'm always being asked to give to this cause and that cause and this cause and another cause. I believe that God expects our benevolence to be given through the local church. And the reason that I believe this is that when you give to a local church, our eldership and our leadership, uh, they have some say, they, they look at our gifts and they make sure that they're used properly. That's good stewardship. If you give to this thing that's being asked over the television or you hear it on the radio, it may be a great cause, but there's no accountability. And I think when we give to, uh, to something that we're going to, to, to give money to God's kingdom, it needs to have accountability. Because see, there's no other entity that the Bible speaks of except for the local church that we might give so that there is accountability and there's good stewardship. So as we give today, think about that and be very cautious about what you give to. 
because you, you have no accountability when you just send a check to something. And I would appreciate it, and I think you would too, if we were better stewards than that. So let's, uh, let's pray about our gifts today and let's be wise as we give. Heavenly Father, you do bless us beyond our own wild imagination. Lord, help us to be frugal, help us to be generous, help us to be wise as we give to your kingdom's work, that that work might be accomplished through your church, Lord, through your local body that, that tries and strives to honor you with what we do in every area of our ministry. So thank you that we have an opportunity to give today. So bless all those that give to the kingdom's work here at Lincoln Hills. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been asking the question, what does it mean to be alive? We, we said that if, if you were to ask a random sampling of individuals this question, you'd probably get a lot of different responses because we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about what it means to have life. We looked at the scriptures and we noted what John, one of Jesus' first followers and closest friends, said about this topic in uh, his epistle, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 says, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. As Christians, we said that this sounds like, you know, this sounds great, but we also kind of instinctively know that we can know Jesus without actually having a relationship with Him. And so last week we said that our first step in living again is we must die. We, we talked about salsa and how salsa is actually like the product of of death. Both Jesus and Paul reminded us that real life begins in death, specifically when we die to ourselves. That means that our desires, they take a backseat to Jesus. Our dead way of living has to be put to death or it will eventually one day kill us. We close by Looking at the words of Jesus, he says, If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Now, we got to be honest, that's a pretty powerful and persuasive passage of Scripture. But the problem is, folks will read that, they'll be moved by it, but then they'll mistakenly conclude that they get to decide what giving up their life looks like, that they get to define the scope of their sacrifice or the depth of their death. And that's just simply not the case. Think about it like this. Um, if I wanted to bake a cake, I might get to pick the flavor of the cake, but there are specific ingredients and specific instructions that I have to follow in order for the cake to come out right, for, for the cake to come out the way that I want it to. Um, I can't arbitrarily say, ooh, salt, I don't think that belongs in a cake. I'm going to leave it out. Or white vinegar, ooh, white vinegar is gross. I'm not putting that in my cake. Or I can't say, mm, I'm not really comfortable using the oven. And so ovens and microwaves, they kind of do the same thing. I'm just going to put my cake in the microwave. If you do this, you're not going to end up with a cake. You're going to end up with a mess. Over the last few weeks, we've discussed that we must die to ourselves to have real life. And today, what we're going to do is open up the New Testament and see what the step-by-step -step instructions are for dying well. The fact is, there are lots of different cakes and different kinds of recipes that we can follow when we're making a cake. And each, of the, each cook gets to pick what recipe they're going to follow. However, in the New Testament, Jesus claims to be the way, the truth, and the life. And according to him, 
no one comes to the Father except through him. So if we want life, if we want to have real, genuine life, we need Jesus. And specifically, we need to follow the instructions found in God's Word above all else, above anyone else. We need to follow the Scriptures. Your grandma is probably a sweet old lady who, like most grandmas, can bake one heck of a cake. But when it comes to dying well and living again, her recipe for that doesn't necessarily matter. Or your old preacher, you know, at the church that you went to when you were growing up, he probably had all kinds of amazing insights and, and valuable um, uh, w- wisdom on all kinds of various topics. However, if his opinion on the subject of dying well and living again departs or differs from the instructions that God provides for us in the New Testament, I would humbly recommend to you that you forget what your old preacher has to say and instead stand on God's unchanging, unfailing word. And this caution, it applies for me as well. Look, I'm a man, right? I'm a human being. Don't take what I say as the truth, right? Especially on the subject of dying well. What I would suggest that you do is study the scriptures for yourself. Stand on the unmoving, unshaking, unwavering word of God and hold it up against what I'm sharing with you this morning. So again, we've said that we must die to ourselves to have real life. And let's say that we believe that Jesus died so that we could have hope, but we don't want to settle for being believers because we know that you can believe in Jesus without having a relationship with him. We want to be followers of Jesus. So what's next? To die well, we must first repent of our sins and be baptized into Christ. So 50 days after Jesus Uh, was crucified on the cross, the Holy Spirit of God came and rested on the place where Jesus' uh, disciples had gathered, and they began speaking in languages that they had never, ever studied before. Onlookers to this amazing event thought that these folks were drunk, and the crowd that had gathered soon realized that they, they weren't drunk, that they were They were actually praising God in the native languages of people who were in town for the uh, celebration of Pentecost. Immediately, the Apostle Peter gets up and he preaches the first gospel message. You see, before this, there was no church and there was only a smattering of disciples or followers of Jesus. During his sermon, Peter reached back into the Old Testament and explain how what was written there is connected to what was going on in front of their very eyes. Point by point, Peter makes the case that Jesus was God's Son, the Messiah, and that He showed up on the scene and lived among them. Jesus came to show mankind how to to live. But Peter then argues that the Jewish people, with the help of wicked men, were responsible for putting Jesus to death. Luke records Peter's words in this way in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 36. He says, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Much like us, they heard the gospel and it pierced their hearts. It's it's clear that they believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that he died. And on top of that, they are coming to grips with the fact that they are responsible for his death. They were, one way of looking at it is they, they were dead meat, right? And so what they want to know is what do they do about the predicament that they have found themselves in? Well, Peter goes on in verse 38 and he says this, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So to repent literally means to change directions, not just 
physically but mentally as well. It means to stop pursuing what you think is best or what you think is right and start marching toward God by faithfully following Jesus. Remember the proverb that we read last week. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 25 reminds us that there is a path that is before each of us that seems right, but it ends in death. Okay, our best fails. What we think is right is often just not the case. And continuing to trust ourselves will not bring us real, genuine, lasting life. It kind of reminds me of the, the famous quote that's been attributed to Einstein that goes, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Repentance is the refusal to give in to the insane idea that we can please God and reach Him without Jesus. That notion is absolutely crazy, but lots of people over the centuries have tried it and exhausted themselves only to ultimately give up on God and walk away from Him. Instead, what we really need is to change course and follow Jesus. And then Peter adds, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What's the purpose or the significance of this baptism? Well, according to Peter here, this baptism is the place where sins are forgiven. Luke uses similar language in Acts chapter 22. After Ananias shares the gospel with Saul, he says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. Not only does it seem as though our baptisms mark the place where our sins are washed away from us, but in Romans chapter 6, Paul outlines the other dramatic changes that are connected to our baptisms into Christ, saying, Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful lives were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. See, in, in Paul's thinking, baptism is the place where we died with Christ, according to verse 3. Baptism is the place where new life begins, according to verse 4. Baptism unites us with Jesus, according to verse 5. Baptism is the place where freedom begins, according to verse 7. Not only is something mysterious happening and, and taking place when someone is baptized, but baptism is also loaded with symbolic significance. When we're immersed or when we're dunked in the waters at our baptism, we're like dead bodies, right? Our eyes are closed, we're under the water, we're not breathing. It's like we've been placed in a watery grave only to be resurrected by the power of some outside force or outside individual. To die well, we must repent of our sins and be baptized into Christ. One is not more important than the other because both are vital ingredients to dying well. If we never repent or change course, what, what value is there in being baptized? If we repent but choose not to be baptized, when are we joined with Jesus? And how do we receive new life? And, and how do we experience the freedom that comes from having our sins washed away? On top of this, baptism was commanded by Jesus. I mean, think back to what Jesus said as, as he was ascending into the heavens, what he told his first followers. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. How? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do we suppose that we can die well without obeying the commands of Jesus? Surely not. Jesus himself says in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, obey my commandments. 
So dying well, step number one, is repent and be baptized. Dying well, step number two, is allow the Holy Spirit to reshape you and specifically reshape the way you think and interact with the world. Look back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38 with me for a moment, if you will. It says, Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, receiving God's Holy Spirit is absolutely critical to dying well because we begin to walk in the power and view the world through the eyes of the Spirit rather than our own. Take a look at what Jesus said in John chapter 14 in its context. He said, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He leads the followers of Jesus into all truth. You may know this, you may not, but the the same Saul or Paul that we've mentioned several times already this this morning, who wrote a bulk of the New Testament, he, he wasn't always a big fan of Jesus or the followers of Jesus. He didn't just despise them, he, he actively uh, sought ways to ruin their lives. He actively sought to imprison them, and he applauded circumstances when they were murdered or put to death. Then, one day, uh, the resurrected Jesus meets Saul on the road to Damascus and has a face-to-face conversation with him. Acts chapter 9 records the beginning of Paul's transformation, saying, As he was approaching Damascus on his mission, and that's a mission to destroy the lives of Christians, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. So before his experience on the Damascus road, Saul was a zealous defender of the Old Testament law. He was disciplined and well-educated and perfect by the standards of many. Writing to the Philippians, uh, he explained it like this. He said, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. This step of allowing the Holy Spirit to reshape us from the inside out is absolutely critical, but too often it's, it's overlooked by the followers of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is literally God's Spirit that's come to live in the followers of Jesus. The Spirit wants us to be like Jesus, and He'll tag team with God's Word to help make that happen. But we have to be willing to accept a perspective on life that that maybe we've never had before. The Holy Spirit will be pressing us in all kinds of different ways to breathe new life into places that were dead in us, to do all kinds of things that maybe we'd we'd never done before. And at first, this is probably going to be uncomfortable, right? But the Holy Spirit didn't come to make us comfortable. The Holy Spirit came to help us live like Jesus, to experience real, genuine, authentic, vibrant, vivacious life. To truly die, we must repent and be baptized. This joins us with Jesus, but this isn't where things end. This is where things begin. Next, we must allow the Holy Spirit to to change our perspective on life. Inevitably, what we value will change because, I mean, we're not dead anymore. John makes it clear that those who claim to be in Christ will walk the way that Jesus did. And the Holy Spirit is the advocate that helps us die well so that we can live like Jesus. Luke tells us 
that the forgiveness of our sins and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit is available to us all. He says this in verse 39, this promise is to you, to your children, and to those who are far away, all who've been called by the Lord our God. If we want to live, we must first die. To die well means we first repent and change course. We must be baptized into Christ and have our sins washed away. This makes room for the Holy Spirit to come and live within us so that He can then reshape the way we think and live and speak. Repentance and baptism and living under the influence of and by the power of the Holy Spirit are essential ingredients to dying well. If we remove any of these necessary components, we'll be left with something outside of God's plan for us. Repentance changes our direction. Baptism connects us with Jesus and initiates our freedom from sin by by washing it away. The Holy Spirit reshapes our thoughts, feelings, and attitudes. If we settle for trying to add a little bit of Jesus to our dead lives, rather than giving our dead lives to Jesus, we will only end up rotten, which is precisely what we're going to talk about next Sunday. If you've never decided to follow Jesus, you can do that today. You can repent of your sins and be baptized and have all your sins washed away. Following Jesus isn't something you'll have to do on your own. Remember, God will send the Holy Spirit to reshape you from the inside out. And oh, by the way, you'll have a church family to encourage you and spur you along on your journey as well. If you need to make a decision and follow Jesus, that invitation is open to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the plan that you've put in place to rescue us from our sin. Father, we just ask that you speak to our hearts through the power of your spirit, that you help us to walk in step with you Father, for those of us who have been following you for a long time, we just ask for your spirit to help guide us. Help us to continually submit to him so that our perspective on the world around us might change and so that we might glorify you and have the opportunity to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. We love you and pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. dark tried to hide you steal you away death tried to keep you inside of the grave the enemy fought you he tried but he lost cannot be stopped When we cried for freedom You tore down the walls The weight of our burdens You carried it all Our fear and our failures hang dead on the cross you cannot be stopped mover of mountains breaker of chains Jesus is trying over the grave sing hallelujah the battle is won nothing can stay against our God We stand on your victory We shout out your praise Miracle maker Your mighty to save Awesome in power 
limitless in love. Oh, you cannot be stopped. We say, mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus is trying over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus is trying over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. Oh, sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. Oh, nothing can stop. 